uh, some of you, I think many of you, but maybe not all of you, were uh, at the talk I gave earlier today. Uh, and that talk was about thinking about mathematics not just as a set of skills, like how to factor a quadratic or how to take a derivative uh, or pr some procedure for doing something, but also as a set of virtues that are built by um, uh, teaching mathematics well and, and thinking about uh, attending to basic human desires, such as desires for beauty, for truth. Um, uh, in, in, in the classical movement, often you're thinking about goodness, beauty, and truth. Well, these things can, can show up in mathematics as well. Uh, I want to talk today, uh, uh, have us think through uh, uh, several of these desires, a desire for beauty, a desire for exploration and play, and a desire to seek deep truths. And I would love for you to answer this question. And we'll see where we're at as people respond. So uh, I'd like to help my students appreciate beauty. Looks like, OK, we're sort of in the middle here in terms of how people have responded uh, to these prompts. So I, can, I see that many of you are probably already thinking about this. This is, after all, a classical conference. Um, but you feel like you could be doing more. And so I'm going to maybe try to stretch you uh, in this direction uh, as we um, think through some of these questions together. Oh, cool. I can see how many people responded in each thing. <laughs> this is great. It's the first time I'm using Menti, actually, just to see how this goes. OK, and so one of the, uh, the, 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 the messages that I, I uh, spoke about this morning is that a great math education should build not just skills, but virtues. And I'm talking uh, not just virtues like thinking and reasoning well, but also affective virtues, like an affection for mathematics, the expectation of enchantment, a certain hopefulness, a disposition to beauty. Uh, and these virtues make your life richer. And uh, they're what it means to flourish, right? And, and uh, mathematics can help build some of these virtues uh, as well. And so uh, here are just a few basic human desires, uh, beauty, exploration, play, truth. We're going to talk about each of these a little bit, depending on the amount of time. So um, what I want you to do now is to think about some experience of beauty you've had. And it doesn't have to be mathematical. It could be you know, a walk through the forest. Uh, what I, want, I don't want you to type in the experience. I want you to type in an adjective that describes the experience. So a uh, walk through the forest might be um, uh, joyful or something like that, OK? I want you to describe some adjectives or words that describe that experience. I'd love to see what you come up with. Ooh, transcendent. Awe, true, pleasing. Breathtaking, intangible, delightful, peaceful. Oh, interesting. That was the, actually the number one response uh, this morning as well. Peaceful. Uh, wonder and awe seem to be important. Satisfying actually has gotten several votes uh, already. Uh, harmonious. OK, lots of great adjectives here that describe what it means to feel and experience beauty. It's satisfying, it's surreal, it's sublime, it's golden, it's just. Oh, just, OK. I was wondering what that meant. Just as in just what? Um, but just like justice, I think, yes? OK, great. Now, um, how many of these adjectives describe the experience students have in your classroom? And how can we actually? help our students experience these things in our mathematics classroom. And I want you to think about some specific, tangible ways that you can in encourage students to have experiences like this in your classroom. Some specific, tangible ways. You know, for instance, uh, uh, one way you might do this is to actually show some art in the, in the classroom. Beautiful artwork, right? So that's just an example of an idea. And maybe it's mathematical art. Who knows? Okay. Um, how can we make our classrooms not feel sterile? Um, one of my colleagues plays music, 
when people come into the room. So maybe you don't actually have a classroom, you're itinerant, you move from room to room. So, but maybe you can create an experience that people can, can feel a certain way. Okay, you have some ideas in your head, take a moment, discuss with your neighbor, and um, type some of them in the response box. So I so want specific ideas. Go ahead and type some things in. Uh, if you already used up your response, you can use a friend's phone. And we'll talk through some of these. So there's uh, here several people said you could display things, artwork related to math, 3D printed visual toys, art that provokes wonder. Oh, print and display particularly elegant graphs. OK, interesting. Um, uh, show connections between different concepts. That's a way to have students experience wonder uh, and beauty. Um, students engage in developing the ideas. Play classical music when students are entering. And again, for a music break halfway through class. <laughs> um, oh, your classroom culture does a lot to, yeah, that's something that we have to pay a lot of attention to that's not just the, the, the work that we do, uh, but it's also the work that your students do and learn, you equip them to do to make the classroom an inviting, peaceful space. Um, as teacher, I can help students make connections between related ideas to help them see beauty in the work being done. Um, build a culture where mistakes are okay. Very, very important if you want your students to feel peaceful and not stressed out uh, because they might be shamed for a, a wrong answer. Uh, enjoy math for math and not because of when I will use it. Um, your own excitement, yes, very important. Convey your excitement for stuff that you are uh, teaching. Set up math, yeah, that's one of the biggest things, I think. Like, if I think about many of the teachers who had most influence on me, they were teachers who showed their excitement, uh, and it made me want to know, what do they see in this that I don't see? Like, I had a really great English teacher, for instance, and English wasn't something I was particularly fond of, but she just made literature come alive, and she, was, she seemed so excited by it, and made me want to know, what does she see that I don't see? Um, be strategic about your presentation. Set up math problems as puzzles to be solved. History of math discoveries. Yeah, connect to history. Great. Okay, lots of great ideas here. Um, welcoming students physically. Shake hands, make eye contact. Yes, very, very important. And also important to be mindful. It, it took me many years to realize that I wasn't making eye contact with all the students in my class. But I was only make, making contact mainly with the ones who answered questions, right? Or maybe people sitting at the front of the room. OK, wonderful uh, ideas here. Um, I want to say a little bit about beauty and the various kinds of beauty that you might, uh, might uh, be fostering. So you know, the, the, the very tangible experiences of beauty with you know, art and with music, those are what are, I would call sensory beauty. You know, it's a baby, baby, basic, the first basic level of beauty that, that you think about in any, in any domain. Um, but you know, in math, there's actually more, more kinds, deeper kinds of beauty um, that are a little more subtle. Um, there's the beauty that I like to call wondrous beauty, the beauty of ideas, right? Like the, the idea in calculus that you can add an infinite number of things and actually get an answer, right? That's kind of a surprising, um, non-intuitive idea that comes out of calculus. Or um, uh, sometimes I like to talk, I, I, I like to have various pithy phrases for describing a class I'm teaching. And so I encourage you to think about how you might do this in a sentence, right? What do you think, what is calculus? Now, very popular way of talking about calculus is it's, it's all about rates of change, which it is. But what's another way to describe calculus? I like saying calculus is wrestling with the infinite. Right? How do we actually get our hands on adding up a bunch of things, uh, infinite number of things? Or how do we get our hands on this idea of infinitesimal change? Uh, geometry, I like to talk about that as seeing hidden structure, structure that you don't immediately obviously see. Um, algebra is the, 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 prop, the, um, the ability to solve many problems at once, right? That's why you develop algebraic thinking, algebraic formulas. It's so that you, know, that you have one formula for computing something rather than every time you encounter an instance of you know, a, an interest rate problem, you have to re-derive, re, you know, think about it over and over again. Statistics is the art of being a good detective with data. 
I like framing statistics as we're going to all learn in this class how to be a great detective, right? Who doesn't want to be a great detective? Um, the qualities of wondrous beauty is this feeling of simplicity, discovery, paradox. We'll talk more about paradoxes in a minute, but um, this uh, puzzle that I showed earlier today is a puzzle where you rearrange pieces of the puzzle and it looks like a square is missing. That causes you to step back and say, what? What's going on? Or this paradox. So like, you know, when I'm teaching calculus, one of the first things I, I might uh, do to, to, to have them think about how strange it is to add up infinitely many things is to ask them to add up this series of numbers, 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 etc. And ask them, does that have a sum? And, uh, you know, of course, if you take that expression and you group the first, you know, group, it, group those things in pairs, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, 1 minus 1, those all cancel. So if you look at it that way, you might think it's 0, 0 plus 0 plus 0. But if you take the first one off and then you group the minus, the, the second and the third terms together, minus 1 and 1, minus 1 and 1, minus 1 and 1, it looks like the answer might be 1, 1 plus a bunch of zeros. And so there's something very weird going on here. It's a paradox, and it makes you wonder, what does it even mean to add up infinitely many things? Right? This is the kinds of things that I do to spark curiosity, to spark questions, to get people thinking that, um, that what they're learning is not completely obvious. Here's another kind of beauty um, that you encounter in math. It's insightful beauty. This is a beauty of reasoning and understanding. And it's, it's the kind of beauty that, that I think is actually pretty unique to mathematics, that, you, that demonstrations of truths themselves can be awe-inspiring. And this also highlights a very important virtue that, uh, that if you're teaching well, you'll build, is the ability to communicate mathematics, communicate it well. Um, so here's an example of, of insightful beauty. Um, there's many, lots of different examples, but here's, here's one that I like. Um, if I think back to my own experience when I was a kid, probably the first time that I thought math was cool was when a friend, my, one of my parents' friends, came over to the house. He heard I was, you know, that I seemed to like math, and he said, I, so I liked math, but I didn't think it was cool, okay? But he, he said, um, do you know how to add up all the numbers from 1 to 100? And I'm like, uh, no, I don't. You know, like, it, no, it's hard. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, it's going to take a long time. And he said, let me show you an easy way. Uh, and, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain this, but I'm going to do it, uh, uh, well, I'll do it with the numbers 1 through 10. So if you have the numbers 1 through 10 and you lay them all out in a row, and you grab the first one and the last one, that sums to? 11. And you take the second one and the second to the last one, that's 9, and add them, that sums to? 11. And you have basically pairs as you grab them from the outside in, all produce pairs that sum to 11. And how many pairs are there if there are 10 total numbers? Half of them, 5. So 5 times 11 is 55. <laughs> Whoa! To me, that, that, that blew my mind. Right? And of course, he did it with 1 to 100. It was even, like we, 1 to 100, you could do that too. And, and of course, what do you do? You get pairs that add up to 101, and there are 50 such pairs, right? And, and of course, when you see something amazing like this, it makes you want to do something else with it. Like, wait a minute, can I also do, add up the numbers from 1 to, uh, 1 to 26? Uh, yeah, I guess so. We, I mean, yeah, the, the pairs add up to 27, yes. And there are 13 pairs. So if I could just do 13 times 27 in my head, or with a calculator, we could, we'd be good, right? But we actually can do 13 times 27 in our heads. Because 13 is 10, uh, 20 minus 7, and 27 is 20 plus 7. So a minus b times a plus b is a squared minus b squared. So that should be 20 squared minus 7 squared, which is 400 minus 49, which is 351. Right. Oh, we can do that. And I used a little bit of algebra there, too. That's awesome. I didn't, of course, I, you wouldn't do that to a, a little kid who's five years old or whatever. But, <laughs> um, but that, this was my first experience of beauty. Like, whoa, that's neat. 
Okay, um, what does it feel like? Elegance, clarity, insight. Um, it can be an aha moment like this, but it can also be a slowly growing appreciation over time. One of the ways that I dislike to describe beauty is it's like the, the experience is like the end of a mystery novel when everything gets explained, right? That's like, oh, yeah, I see how all the pieces fit together. I see why that person did that, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and, you, and students can have that experience in our math classes. That's what keeps them coming back for more. If you talk to professional mathematicians, um, in fact, surveys have been done asking mathematicians why they do math, the number one reason for, for, for most mathematicians is beauty, because they want this experience of beauty. So how can we help our students see that? Um, I have a website called Math Fun Facts. If you Google Math Fun Facts to find it, you can um, see several of the kinds of examples that I used to, to whet people's appetite for beautiful ideas uh, in mathematics. All right, um, and I mentioned earlier this morning that I like to ask reflection questions as a way of having students process what's going on in the way that what they're seeing. And also as a way for me to learn what's going, at what, what they find beautiful, which is sometimes surprising. So um, here's one, the, the question, one question I, I uh, gave, and I'm gonna invite you now to think about a question that you might ask to prompt uh, to encourage them to reflect on beauty. This one is consider one idea from the course you found beautiful and explain why it's beautiful to you. And in the, uh, the follow-up comments, I ask them to explain how it's similar or different than other kinds of beauty human beings encounter. Take a moment now, discuss, think about it, discuss what, what, what's another essay prompt you might use to encourage a reflection on beauty. Okay, lots of interesting responses. Feel free to keep typing some in, but here's some that are uh, nice here. Um, how can numbers be beautiful? Yeah, that's an interesting prompt uh, for students to, to reflect a little bit. And actually, you know, one of the things I, I want to just say this again, because it's, it's a point that's worth repeating. Um, if you say you value something, but it never shows up on your assessments, students are, never gonna, are not going to get the message, right? So if you say you value reflection, you value you want them to think about truth, goodness, and beauty. Um, it should show up in our reflections. How can numbers be beautiful? What aha moments did you have this year in math? What emotions do you feel when you solve a math problem? Oh, like that one? Which uh, pattern do you find most beautiful and why? There's another one about patterns here. Um, what equation that we discussed is the most elegant? Explain why. Um, I might give students a quote about beauty from a famous mathematician uh, or a text that they read in class. And, um, and now that one disappeared. Where did it go? Uh, and, and then, <laughs> somehow it won't scroll all the way down, so I don't know what, what was being said there. Um, what was your favorite moment, in, uh, aha moment, and why? Oh, ask them to relate to their math experience, that's what it says. Given some theorems or solutions, describe what makes them beautiful or not. Okay, I like that. You give students the option of saying what's something that isn't beautiful um, and why. Wonderful. These are great responses here. What's your favorite theorem? Question and why. Okay, lots of great, great ideas here for encouraging students to reflect. And you can, you know, put these on regularly, these kinds of questions, on their homeworks. And not only will they enjoy doing them, you'll enjoy reading their responses. Um, here's a, a second thing I want you to think about is how do we make problems more exploratory? And you know, there are lots of books out there that can, that can, that can help you, fig, you know, find exploratory problems. Um, one of the, the books that I uh, recommend for exploratory problems is a book called Open Middle Math by uh, Robert Kaplinsky. Uh, it has lots of problems that are just open-ended, and that's wonderful. But we don't always have the luxury of having a book, a resource, to, to help us find problems. So here's a dull question. Simplify this algebraic expression. Now, first of all, um, I think simplify is ambiguous. Um, in college, when students come, come to me, sometimes, you know, here simplify means multiply it all out, right? But in college, sometimes this is the better expression to use because you want to see the factors. So if you're ever going to if you're ever going to use the, the the command simplify, you should tell students for what purpose. 
Okay, not all your texts will do that, but you should do that. Anyways, but this is kind of a dull problem. It's like, okay, no thinking, I just do some stuff, right? I do my algebraic rules. Okay, more interesting is a question that forces you to grapple with the underlying ideas. So a more interesting problem might be, a version of this might be two numbers sum to 10. Find a pair whose product is large as possible. I mean, that is, after all, what you're doing with x plus y and x minus y is your, the, the sums stay the same no matter what y is. Uh, or, which is larger, 9 times 11 or 8 times 12? Right, that, uh, that, and of course here you might move from this to have them conjecture, make a conjecture about when this pair is as big as possible. That can lead into an algebraic expression like this. All right, so there's an example of how you might take a dull problem and make it interesting. And of course what makes a problem interesting often is the words um, create, or compare, or uh, what happens when, but these are all prompts that begin a more interesting conversation with the material. So here's what I'd love you to do. Take a moment and make this question more interesting, more exploratory. And exploratory often means multiple ways of solving the problem or seeing a path to a solution, okay? Take a moment to think about that, discuss with your group, and type some potential better versions of this question. OK, lots of uh, interesting responses coming through. Um, just go through some of them here. Um, what happens when you increase the power or the side length by one? Um, create a table. Is there a pattern that emerges? OK, that's great. That's exploratory, because you're asking them to look for something. Um, and you might do this, of course, before you show them the identity for x plus 1 cubed. Is there a way to represent this visually? Great. Um, find the volume of a cube with various side lengths. That's another one where it's exploratory because they're trying out lots of things. How is the volume changing? Oh, what are all the ways to write the expression x plus 1 cubed? Which one is the most elegant and why? Oh, okay, this is great, too, because it invites a conversation about what do you mean by elegant? And maybe part of that conversation you'll see will, will revolve around what, what it's for. What do I need this expression for? Um, uh, another one here, think of a number, add one, take your new number, multiply it by itself three times. What did you get? Is there a quicker way to find out your answer than the way you calculated it? Make a 3D model. How else could we write this problem? I guess that's the question I asked you. <laughs> How else could you? Connect it to Pascal's triangle. These are all great ideas. So I try to make it a goal in every homework set I give to my students to have at least one problem that's exploratory, right? Something that is going to force them to, to think a little bit deeper about it and also that they might enjoy. Um, the, the other thing to think about here, of course, is, gosh, it's going to be, maybe it's hard to grade something that has so many solutions. Well, one thing, one potential way to think about it is you're going to learn a lot from your student responses because they'll notice things you'll never have noticed before. Another is you can actually, if grading's a burden, you can actually have students look at each other's answers and, uh, and discuss them and, um, and, so, and grade them in some sense. Okay, oh, asking to think through a situation. What situation would you want to calculate this? That's great. That's a little bit of exploratory thinking because they have to think of a scenario for which this makes sense. Okay, here's another example. Um, compute the volume of this cylinder with some given dimensions. Make, how would you make this question more exploratory? Feel free to discuss and suggest alternatives. Okay, lots of interesting responses coming through. I, I'll just read out some of them. Um, uh, how is the volume of cylinder related to its height? That's a question that invites students to think and maybe ex play around with various combinations of numbers. It's great. How much of your favorite drink can you pour into this container, and is there a way to know this beforehand without actually pouring it? Uh -huh. um, how would increasing the radius of the cylinder by one affect the volume? Ah, okay. Estimate the number of jelly beans in this jar on my desk. 
Now that's, that's exploratory um, because uh, while there is a fixed number of jelly beans, students will have to make some kind of assumptions about how much volume the jelly beans uh, take and how they, you know, they don't fit together perfectly, right? So um, that's, uh, estimation problems are a great way to, to, to take a problem and make it exploratory. Um, uh, if I change the, the cylinder's height by half, what fact, how, how much would that change the volume? Can you make a bigger cylinder by rolling a piece of paper hot dog style or hamburger style? Oh, interesting. Does the volume, uh, Chris, you could, you could set some, some direction on this to help people see what, you know, either make it flatter like a hamburger or taller. Does that, do, does that make it better or worse? These are, these are all great exploratory questions. Awesome. Um, I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to do this one, but, but I think you get the picture. The idea is you, you, you have a dull problem. How would you make it more exploratory, make it more interesting? Um, estimation problems are a great way to do this. Um, if you go to the, uh, Jane Street's website, they're a finance company. Uh, they, uh, they run a, a, a student competition every year that's basically about estimating interesting problems, like the volume of the Greenland ice sheet. That's actually a problem you can give to high school students. Estimate the volume of the Greenland ice sheet. They're going to have to look up you know, some things about Greenland. Uh, they're going to have to be resourceful. But how are they? That's a great modeling question, right? Um, uh, the amount of time it takes light from the sun to reach Voyager 1, which is one of the, the very early Voyager probes. Again, they'll have to look up some things there. Um, to, to be resourceful. Estimate the number of tweets tweeted on Twitter in 2012, right? These are all interesting questions that might be, uh, provoke thoughtful discussion in your classrooms. All right, finally, I want to talk about um, truth. Uh, I love this quote by Blaise Pascal. Truth is so obscure in these times and falsehood so established that unless we love the truth, we cannot know it, right? Sounds like uh, he could be talking about today. How do we have students love the truth? And one of the ways that I try to do this is uh, to build a desire to see a problem from multiple points of view. There's a lot of beauty there when you, you see that there are multiple ways of solving a problem. Students often have enjoy seeing multiple perspectives. Um, the other thing I try to do is highlight paradoxes, as I mentioned earlier. That helps students you know, actually dig deeper. So, you know, in this particular puzzle, um, the, uh, you know, the, the thing you look at here is, wait a minute, I rearranged these pieces and suddenly I'm missing a square? There's something funny going on. And of course, you know, if you sit with this puzzle long enough, and that might mean just leaving it up on your, you know, on, your, on the board for multiple days or weeks even, um, Students will begin to notice things like, oh, maybe the slopes of those red and blue triangles are not actually the same, right? That's actually what's part of what's happening. And it invites you know, deeper discussion. Uh, actually, it turns out that the slopes here are very close, but they're not the same. And they turn out to be ratios of Fibonacci numbers. And that's actually a deep mathematical idea that Fibonacci numbers uh, produce these ratios that are so close that it's actually hard to tell um, what the, that they're different. They're, uh, it turns out Fibonacci numbers are best in some sense for producing uh, approximations to a particular number. In this case, the slope turns out to be close to the golden mean. Um, so here's something I'd encourage you to do. Make it a professional goal to find one new idea, a new puzzle, a paradox every month to learn something new. You can find lots of resources for that. For instance, any book by Martin Gardner, I think you'll find um, is a good, uh, a good place. My Math Fun Facts site's another good place to, as a starting point for finding things that are delightful uh, that you might use to, to provide enchanting experiences for students. And in general, I think it's actually also good just to get into the habit of reading um, popular books about mathematics. Here are some that have appeared in the last uh, few years. Um, one on shape is all about how geometry is used in the real world. Um, Infinite Powers is about um, how calculus has changed the world. 
Uh, the Art of Logic is about thinking logically and how it actually helps you make s the subtitles, make, how to make sense in a, in a world that doesn't by Eugenia Chang. Um, if you have other ideas of books that you like, feel free to type it in the slide. What are some books that you'd recommend? This is just the kind of thing you might do, you know, casually to read, read a little bit to um, improve our own, to, to do our own professional development. If you have books that you like, feel free to type them in. No voting is closed? Oh, it is? Why would it be closed? They didn't know. I'm not sure why it's closed, but if you call out some books, if you have some book ideas, uh, and um, if, as you do that, you could also potentially answer this question, which is not closed. What's one thing you'll do differently uh, as a result of our conversation today? That's the last question. Anyone have books that they recommend that you'd like to highlight for others that you, that you enjoyed reading? Book. My book. Oh, I paid her to say that. <laughs> Measurement by Paul Lockhart. Measurement by Paul Lockhart. Yeah, in fact, uh, the, other, uh, the other book that he wrote, um, I forget what it's called, Mathematician. Mathematician's Lament, is also a classic for any math educator. Other books, um, some that were mentioned this morning. Um, there's a book, this is more about teaching mathematics, so it's not a general book, but it's called um, um, Building Thinking Classrooms by yeah. Peter Lilladol. Um, there's another book that, um, that is also about teaching mathematics called Rough Draft Thinking by Mandy Jensen, about um, seeing math as a process of get, improving drafts. Rough draft math. Those are some that Beauty popped and to truth. Mention. Beauty and truth. Beauty and the truth. And the truth by. The quadrivium by um, Stratford Calcott. By Stratford Cal Calcott. Caldecott. 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 Thank you. Great. Um, feel free to. Type in anything, uh, one thing you'll, you'll do differently. Uh, and thank you very much for having me today.